Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Jason Knight, and on each episode of this podcast, I'll be having inspiring conversations with passionate product people. If you like the sound of that and want to hear from me and some of the finest product thought leaders and practitioners in the world, why not head over to onenightinproduct.com where you can sign up to the mailing list, subscribe on your favorite podcast app, or follow the podcast on social media and guarantee you never miss another episode again. On tonight's episode, we don our lab coats and get scientific as we break down product management practices and examine the five steps on the product science success path and see if we can't insert a sixth. We talk about some of the ways teams can work to ensure they're setting themselves up for success, how much teams should be advocating for best practices versus just getting on with it, and how strong product leadership is needed to make any of this stuff stick. Talking of product leadership, we also tackled a thorny debate about CPTOs and whether it can really work to have one person in charge of product and technology, or whether we should always aim to keep them as aligned, but separate leadership roles. For all this and much more, please join us on One Night in Product. So, my guest tonight is Holly Hester Riley. Holly's a board game geek, former competitive skater, and figure skating coach who's hung up her blades, donned a white coat, and moved into the laboratory complex of product science. Holly's passionate about helping people build great products, teams, and companies, and making a positive impact on the world. And given some of the stories I've seen in the business press, she's got her work cut out. But she's working towards it anyway by teaching people the benefits of good product discovery and experimentation via a consultancy, H2R Product Science, and Matching Product Science podcast. Hi, Holly. How are you tonight? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I am doing fabulous. I do have to ask, is there a product science merchandising line? Like, can I get the lab coats and the goggles and the test tubes and everything with the logos on and stuff? You know, that is a fantastic idea. I think I'll get right on that. (laughs) Excellent. We don't need to do any discovery on that one. It is guaranteed to succeed. Exactly. But let's talk about product science. So you're the founder of H2R Product Science, which is a consultancy. And the website says, We believe there's a science to building high growth products. So we'll talk about the science part in a minute. But in general, what sort of stuff are you helping people with with a consultancy? Yeah, so I help pretty much anybody who's looking to improve the way that they develop product, particularly with a focus on continuous product discovery and experimentation. And I do this with early stage startups, like I coach founders all the way up to enterprises like Capital One and Weight Watchers and everything in between. And the the core thing about them is that they're looking to up their game, that they've read the product books and they're saying, this isn't what life is like for me. (laughs) And I'd really like to figure out how I get closer to that. And then I come in and help them do that, or my team does. Right, fair enough. But that's interesting. A couple of things that are interesting in that. And one of which is like, who is it that's actually calling you in? Is it the leadership of the company, like the founders or the executive team, or are you getting engaged directly by the product team, the CPO, head of product, or whoever it is that's in charge there? Yeah. So in companies that are big enough to have a head of product, so anybody who's past that really early founder stage, it's usually the the head of product or the CPO or, or whatever level they've got going on at their organization. But it's also not uncommon for founders to reach out to me who are really early stage and they're trying to find their first product market fit. Right. So on that product market fit or pre-product market fit type company, then like, is that really your sweet spot? Would you say like, uh, is that like where most of your clients come from? I know you say you talk to enterprises and all throughout the stack and, and big companies and small companies, but would you say that there's a, a waiting in a certain area, like certain types of companies that come to you or certain companies that you can do the most with? Or is it literally just across the board, anyone that comes that you can, you've got something for all of them? Honestly, it's literally across the board. And, and that is really because I believe that there is a science to building high growth products. And there, is a, there are principles that are consistent across building high growth products, regardless of whether you're building that product on a five-person team at a, at a recently founded company or within an established enterprise. Right. But those established enterprises have very different challenges and very different dynamics and very different, in some cases, political struggles that are going on. And everything just feels a little bit harder now. I'm, I've worked for enterprises in the past, so I know that yeah, I know what it can be like. So do you find that the concept, I mean, everyone, every enterprise these days that you kind of see, they're kind of talking about trying to be more product led or trying to be more agile and then they end up start doing something ridiculous like implementing safe or something like that and Duh. you start to wonder where it all went wrong for them. But like 
how easy is it for someone like yourself who's obviously really steeped in all of the great product thinking and you know you've with the podcast you've spoken to so many great people the experience that you have you, you're obviously living and breathing the product world and then you're going into some of these big companies that aren't at all like is that easy to get them to make that transition is there something that for example when you're talking say quote unquote digital transformations that some way to kind of get that first little chink in the armor that you can then start to work on them I wish I could tell you, like, just give them this pill and they will solve the problem. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not It's not that easy. It's definitely hard work. And I think one of the key things for me is always, who are the champions that are bringing you in? You know, you've got to have some, you've got to have buy-in from someone inside the company and what level they're at and how much influence they have is definitely going to have an effect on how successful you can be when you come in to try and help them change. Yeah, absolutely. But are you there then to as you say, go in, help them get set up, make sure they know what they're doing, quote unquote, properly, and then kind of push them on their way like a boat, and then they just sail off into the distance? Or do you have more of an ongoing relationship with these people afterwards and keep checking back in with them and kind of steering them back on the right course once they're actually on their way? So my typical engagements tend to last around a year. I always start with a minimum of three months. Yeah. But I'll usually stick around for somewhere in the range of a year And over that course of time, I'm able to make a significant impact on the way that the product team is functioning and on the lives of the product managers there. And then afterwards, I tend to keep relationships with some of the people. And so I'll check in and see how things are going. But in terms of the professional relationship, it it usually does sort of come to an end, you know, somewhere in that year range. And then, you know, they hopefully have hired the internal staff that they need or put the processes (laughs) in place to make the changes lasting. Yeah, fair enough. And if you had to estimate off the top of your head, how many of those people actually stuck with your principles after you left, would you be able to estimate that? Or is it not possible for you to know? How many people stuck with my principles after I left? I, I think that's difficult to estimate. And now I'm running through all the clients in my head and trying to be like, let me try to do the <laughs> math really quick, but I'm just, you're going to end up with <laughs> like. I was just thinking because Rich, I remember Rich Mirinoff saying it was like 50 50 or something like that. I just wondered if that was like a standard that, industry that number. That is or actually the number that came to mind in my head is, is 50%. So, I mean, I guess I can say that. <laughs> I do feel like there are cases where you know that they aren't doing what you taught. <laughs> and, you know, usually those are cases where maybe you ended the consulting arrangement yourself because you could see that it wasn't going to be successful there. Yeah. And then there are other cases where you hope that they're still working in that way. And I can think of some clients where I know that they're still doing regular customer discovery, regular user interviews and running experiments. So some of both. Well, it's like with kids, right? You just teach them what you can and then hope they <laughs> do something with that afterwards. But you yeah, can't, yeah, but they, for the best. They always come home wearing weird clothes and then listening to music that you don't like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or watching the wrong thing on YouTube. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's not talk about that. (laughs) Yeah. But you're also the head of product and engineering at your base. So how do you manage to find the time to to do both those things? I mean, that consultancy sounds like quite a lot of work. So how can you maintain like a full-time gig and that consultancy? Yeah. Well, the truth is that the consultancy has been around for about five years and I did your base for about a year and a half. I've recently come back to full-time consulting. And during that year and a half that I was doing your base, I wasn't doing as much consulting work. So kept the podcast going, kept coaching clients and continued to gain new coaching clients and do some consulting work, but not as heavy because I was so focused on your base for this period of time. Well, I was going to ask actually, I mean, obviously it's great that you're back consulting full time and helping loads more people, but you are the head of products and engineering at your base, which is an interesting mix because there seems to be a lot of headwind behind this whole idea of CPTOs at the moment and the idea that actually it's much more efficient to get product people and engineering people and all of the other types of people that report in through maybe a CPO or CTO into the same function and have everything managed from one central place. Now, I'm personally not 100% sure that I'm pro that because I think that it's nice to have that kind of healthy tension between product and development to keep each other honest and keep each other moving in the right direction and not worrying too much about technology or too much about product, but trying to find a nice mix in the middle. But do you think there are any solid benefits from maybe the time you had at your base or just in general of of having that all mixed up and reporting in through the same leadership? 
Yeah, I do think there are benefits. I think one of the things for me that's big in product leadership is how you communicate the initiatives that you're going to be working on and how you communicate the why behind the work that you're doing. Yeah. And I think that as a head of product and engineering who came up through product, that was always really central to me. And so I feel like my team was always understanding all of the reasons why we're doing things and what it means to our customers and to our business in a way that is not always as central when those roles are separate. At the same time, I have to say, in some ways, this role that I had at your base being combined was a factor of the size of the company that, you know, the company was pretty small, was an early stage startup. So I didn't have a whole product team to lead. I had a product manager and myself. (laughs) <laughs> Somewhere along the way, somehow I, I managed to impress my boss that I had good leadership skills and uh, that I'd be really <laughs> helpful on the engineering side too. And so I stepped up and said, okay, I'll take that on. But then when you're in a situation where you have to make a judgment call between the two disciplines, so like a technical implication and a product implication, and again, the cliche would be that someone that was heavily product or heavily engineering would really err inside of one over the other because that's where their instincts lie. Like, How would you stop yourself or how did you stop yourself effectively reverting to type and going back to your area of most expertise? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, to me, the best, those big decisions where you might have conflict between the product leadership and the tech leadership, at the end of the day, the right decision to make is going to be the decision that's best for the business as a whole. Yeah, And that is going to need to take into account both the impact on customers, the impact on the business, and the impact on the tech stack. And I like to think that even when I was pure product leader and not splitting the responsibilities, that I was still a very engineering sympathetic product leader who believes that it's a smart product decision to invest in the right technology and the right infrastructure at the right time. So for me, the that conflict doesn't resonate so strongly because I'm actually super passionate about paying down tech debt and, you know, having good engineering practices and making sure that we're making good architecture decisions as well as we're making good product decisions. I'm sold. I think it's interesting because I came from an engineering background myself, but I've massively tried to push myself away from that over the years to try to make sure that those other parts of the three Venn diagram circles are all kind of covered and that I'm equally as able to contribute in all of those things. And I guess the way I was thinking about it when I started seeing more conversations about CPTOs is like, you have to be kind of not necessarily a unicorn, but you really have to be someone who's really conscious of your position and really conscious of, of how your decisions or what's informing your decisions. And I'm not 100% confident that everyone would do that. But I guess you could probably argue the same about having rubbish CPOs and rubbish CTOs, right? There's always the chance for someone to be bad. And I guess on the one hand, I, I'm thinking, well, you know, at least if you have a CPO and a CTO, you can kind of hear them justifying their decisions to each other rather than it all being locked up in one person's head. But at the same time, I guess ultimately, to your original point, it's like, well, as long as it's good for the business, it's good for the business, right? And that's really how you measure success. Yeah, I think that really great CPOs and really great CTOs have a lot of skill that overlaps. I think there's a lot of... Yeah. The great CTO understands why something is good for the business and good for the customer and isn't purely interested in building the most awesome current technology. (laughs) And a great CPO is also going to be understanding the value of investing in the technological infrastructure. And if your CPO isn't doing that, then they probably have some learning to do. (laughs) Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of CPOs out there right now that aren't doing that. But let's... I'm pretty sure there are too. Let's hope they pick up a book or something at some point. Right, so we've chatted before about the product science success path, and you mentioned a five-step plan, the five-step product science plan that you presumably go in and use as the framework for going into these companies and trying to help them along the path of being more effective at building products. So if you're going into a company kind of cold, going in from scratch and trying to get them to start doing product, quote-unquote, properly, What are those five steps that you basically try to take them through? So what I like to talk about is the product science success path. And it's it's five steps, but everybody starts on a different rung of the ladder, right? So some people won't have to take all five steps because they'll already have completed the journey from one to two and, and some will not. 
But that first phase, that first step that's really important is just agile product development. So agile product development in the first place. Like if you're not shipping on at least a biweekly basis, but I say at least with like quite the like hesitation because honestly, you should be shipping much more than that. <laughs> but if you're not, you know, integrating your code regularly and shipping code regularly, then you can't work with me. <laughs> like there's, I'm not, I'm not going <laughs> to fix that problem. Find an agile coach and start with that. Right. So that's like the first stage is if they can't check that box, you're out. Yeah, absolutely. If they can't check that okay. box, I'm done. I will tell them they need to start learning agile and. <laughs> And you find that in some of the large enterprises, you know, sometimes you you do find companies that are still not doing agile or companies that think they're doing agile, but really are not, you know, it's a very common one. Yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, (laughs) extremely common. (laughs) And I think that that actually lends itself well to sort of the second one, which is the second phase is what I call product discovery practitioners. And teams that are at that stage, they do some product discovery activities on top of their agile software development. But they tend to do them only at major decision points, like the beginning of a project yeah. or you know, when there's something major happening. And when you're doing that, you miss a lot of opportunities and you miss a lot of chances to refine your plans and to invalidate assumptions that you're making. And you're, you're not setting your team up for success. And so that first step is really, okay, did you learn Agile and then just take a big plan and break it into two-week chunks and say, great? And- yep, Sharpie on the board. Yeah, exactly. Like if that's where you're at, you still have a lot of work to do. Yep. But that is a that is a place where I will come in and help people. So it's it's not uncommon for me to work with companies that really are just doing product discovery as a project for each major initiative that's happening on its own. Yep. And then the initiative is going and they're writing their specs and they're like, okay, we I figured out the discovery. Now I'm moving into the development phase. <laughs> and that's not the way I believe we should be building products. So yeah. Anybody who's at that stage, I'm going to try to get them to the next stage. And so when somebody is at that stage, what I do is I say, okay, let's set one learning goal for each sprint. Let's say that every sprint, there's something you need to learn. And how do we make space for your product manager, your designer, and your lead engineer, that, that whole trio, to be involved in this learning? And how do we start a cadence of sharing what's learned? So that this becomes something that's as important to the company as what's built. And that's a common a systemic problem is just this focus on what's built, what's built, what's built. And, you know, yeah. like what's learned, even if they are learning, there's, you, you'll see a lot of companies where the learning all stays in the heads of the few people who are involved in the research. Yeah. And, you know, if that's the case, you, you still have some work to do. So I say, okay, let's start with one learning goal. Let's just say, let's get you into a cadence of something happening every sprint. And then once you're able to do that, then you, you're reaching stage three. Stage three is continuous product improvers. So the continuous product improvers are at least learning something every sprint. And these teams usually feel confident in the area that they do the most research in, but they often can get stuck as yeah. they're lacking an aha as to what's going to drive the high growth or a clear reason to prioritize one thing against another. So when you come in and you see a a team at this stage, and this is a pretty common, I would say this is actually the most common stage for teams today that I work with, because they often have read some of the work from people like Marty Kagan and Teresa Torres and Melissa Perry that tells them that they need to be doing more continuous research and be doing something more iterative and be you know, empowering everybody with this knowledge. But yeah. a lot of times people get stuck at that level. They don't understand how to make sure that it's actually really valuable research and that they're not just running experiments for the sake of saying they're running experiments. Yeah, yeah. Ticking a box again, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the thing that I teach at that stage, and this is one of the things that I do with, with most of my clients, is we'll do a pre-mortem risk assessment. And we'll say, okay, yeah. before we go out to do the research, we got to figure out where the risks are. We got to talk about the risks. We got to figure out which risks are big. Yeah. And I always like to do that across what I think of as the five major risks in product development. So there's the risk of value. So it not being valuable enough for the customer to want to use it. There's the risk of feasibility. You know, Like we found a really valuable problem to solve, but we're actually not able to solve it. And that's a problem. Mm-hmm. There's the risk of uh, viability. So maybe we're trying to solve something that's really valuable for the customer and it's feasible, but there's actually no way for us to make a viable business out of it. Yep. And that's also a major risk. 
There's the risk of usability. And so, you know, maybe we do all this, but we create such a crappy user experience that nobody can actually get to the outcome they want to get to. And then finally, there's also the ethics risk. And I think that we should be talking more about that as product people, that you should also stop and say, well, just because we can solve this problem, just because we can build this thing, should we build this thing? What are the ethical implications of it? Uh, Absolutely. So I always encourage people to think about all of those when they're doing their pre-mortem risk assessments. And then we use that to drive the research. And once a team gets really good at that and they get into a cadence where they do the pre-mortem risk assessment pretty regularly, like it's not just a thing that happens once at the beginning of a project, but it's something that they come back to and they reassess and they think about. Then we can get to a place where they become stage four, which is high impact experimenters. So at this stage, the teams are actually really good at figuring out what customers need and they will likely understand what customers are going to do with a given product design. And they're not surprised when they put the product in the hands of customers because the customers are actually doing what they expected because they did enough discovery <laughs> work to understand. Yeah. And that's a great place for a team to be at. I've certainly worked on teams at that place. And that's a lot of progress. And I think that we do a lot of work to do that. But you can't stop there. And the reason you can't stop there is because a lot of times, if you're in that stage, People will get frustrated because they can't necessarily convince the other people in the business the things that they know. So, you know, you think of that product manager who's like, I wasn't surprised by what happened, but everyone around me was. (laughs) Well, yeah, because they thought that it should have been something else and they refused to be shaken off of their original idea, right? Yes, exactly. So they thought their original idea was going to be great and the product person figured out it wasn't going to be, but couldn't convince them not to build it, (laughs) right? Super common story. So much pain. Oh, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So stage five is the magic bullet to fix that then, is it? That's right. That's right. Stage five is what I call high growth product leaders. And at that stage, teams are both effective and impactful in their continuous product discovery practices. So they're not only figuring out what customers are going to do, but they're also able to drive business outcomes and business impacts and good product decisions. Because they're really good at communicating the research in ways that leaders can understand, empathize, and and act on. And once you have all of that, then you have a really well-functioning product team. And I've always seen that create great products. So once you get all of those elements in place, then you're set up for a high-growth product. There you go, then. Success and unicorn status straight afterwards, right? (laughs) That's exactly it, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Just, you know, the next day, the very next day, you just check the box. Yeah. Well, because that's what people <laughs> expect, right? You know, these leaders are going to be sitting there saying, well, you know, Holly's coming in. She's sorted us out. She's got us the wrong five. If we don't immediately succeed, then Holly's approach was wrong and we need to go and do something else instead. I mean, obviously, that's not true. But like, is that, that that's yeah. got to be, I mean, we all, we all know the stories and we've all been there with companies that don't really get discovery or probably you think that some of the things that you've just said sound nice, but they wouldn't work here and all of that kind of stuff. Now, obviously, you said that you wouldn't work with companies that aren't even fulfilling the basic tenets of building software in an agile fashion. But have there ever been any situations? I mean, I'm sure you've worked with a bunch of companies, but have there ever been any situations where you've basically had to kind of pull the ripcord and go because like, you get to like rung three and you realize that it's just not going to happen because the weight of the company or the weight of the company's leadership is just dragging that down? Absolutely. There have been. The situation that I think is the easiest for me to talk about is actually my very first consulting contract after I left Shutterstock was for Toys R Us and well, Toys go. R Us and Babies R Us. And Did you get to meet Jeffrey? I, <laughs> Jeffrey was in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> when I went in there, it was early 2017 and the writing was on the wall, but they were trying hard. They'd brought in a lot of agile coaches. They were trying to hire top tech talent. They'd hired out of Amazon and Google. and Oh, because that always works. Yes, that's always the silver bullet. Just hire someone (laughs) from Google and you'll be be fine. (laughs) So they were working on trying to figure out how to do experimentation and how to do agile. And I could tell that they were not going to make it in time, that even if they could make improvements... You know, it was clear that they needed a turnaround to happen on the scale of a year. And these kinds of changes, you can make these kinds of changes to the culture in on the scale of a year, but you also need to have time for the 
impact to be seen. And so, yeah. you know, that's, that's not, it's not necessarily going to be, you know, Holly comes in, she teaches your team how to do things this way. <laughs> and then, you know, six months later, you have hockey stick growth. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, okay. Where's your ambition, Holly? To- Come on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that's, step six. I, that's exactly. That's step six. Step six, hockey stick growth. No, I mean, I have seen hockey stick growth. I have seen companies that have that kind of thing happening and going on, but they're practicing this way where they're able to make these good decisions based on customer discovery for years, you know, like yeah. they're, it's, it's not like three months into it. <laughs> it's a craft that you have to do every day for a long amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the things that you touched on earlier was the need for really great product leadership to you know, basically come in after you, for example, to then take the ball and run with it or hopefully they're there already and they can kind of come on that journey with you. But I think it's fair to say that there's a bit of a chasm when it comes to getting into leadership in the first place. Not We're not talking about the Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm chasm. We're talking about a different chasm. And that's the kind of chasm between being that individual contributor product manager that's trying to get this stuff done on the ground level and actually then crossing that notional chasm into being a product leader that can then lead their team and do some of the things that you've just been talking about and make sure that those practices are embedded and can really help to drive the team to success. Now, that chasm definitely exists, and it's something that I've been chatting about a bit recently. But I wondered from your perspective, like, how did you cross that chasm in the first place? Well, I did a really good job as an individual contributor. And then people started asking me how I did it. And I started teaching them. And, you know, they were my coworkers. And so, you know, over time it became, okay, well now, now Holly is teaching us about product management and about product discovery and delivery. And then from there, you know, I started to hire product managers to work for me and to design the structure, you know, to say, how, how do we design the right processes and the right infrastructure for these product people to be successful? And, uh, and that's actually something, you know, I could have put this in the uh, notes about interesting facts about me, but I forgot. <laughs> that's something that I'm passionate about because I actually studied chemical engineering. Right. And so that's my background prior to moving into tech. And chemical engineering is two, two, two major things. It's process design and it's product design. And yep. that is, you know, I think once you start getting into product leadership, you're, you're doing org design and that is a form of process design yep. in a way. Yeah, so kind of sounds though, aside from your academic background, which is obviously really helpful, that a lot of your actual progression into leadership positions and being able to coach and and lead and and define those strategies and processes was was kind of school of hard knocks. Is that fair to say? Like you kind of just worked it out as you progressed and presumably did your own experimentation and some of that worked and some of it didn't and kind of iterated your way to being an effective leader. Is that fair to say? I would definitely say that's fair to say. I think that I think I learned a lot. You know, I learned some things by doing them wrong, <laughs> you know, as we all do. We all make mistakes, right? Oh, and I learned yeah. I learned some leadership lessons the hard way. And I also I love to read books, so you know I read yep. books. I went to workshops and tried to learn from the best. And then I came back and I tried to apply it in the role that I was in. And then I went to another company and I tried to apply it there. And you know, to varying degrees of success, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And I feel like the, the teams that I led made a good impact. Well, that's the force multiplier in full effect. But it's interesting you talk about books as well, because there's a common theme going on in and around the product community at the moment. I know we chatted about it before as well, about how there are so many wonderful books out there. And you've mentioned a few of those yourself. You know, talk about Marty's books and Teresa Torres's books and all the other books. And there's these books on my vanity bookcase behind me, all the other books that we've all read. And I'm sure that you and I both share very similar opinions on and would agree with most of the things that are in these books. But there's this kind of theme going on in the community at the moment that those books don't necessarily represent the world of many or maybe even most product managers, because they may be working for companies that are minus one on your scale or something like that, or just in general having really bad internal problems or the very value of product management just isn't clear within that company or for the leaders of that company. Now, there's obviously a a gap, but 
how much do you think that PMs need to just kind of make peace with that and just do their best and try and do what they can to make things a little better versus being a bit more bullish and trying to be that advocate and spokesperson to try and actually drive transformative change across all of these companies? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I I believe that everybody should be trying to make an impact on the people that are around them. And so yeah. if I'm coaching a person who's at a product organization where there are tensions and product isn't functioning very well, and they feel like they're just asked to ship, 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 and they're just feature factories, I always have some tactics that I will share with them that we will try to see if we can help get them out of that cycle. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they also, they can't just go in like a bull in a china shop. They, they can't. <laughs> oh, they can try. They can, <laughs> they can try, but they won't be successful. Not usually, you know. Yeah. It, it, people don't like being told. It, one of the ways that it often comes off is like the product manager is telling everyone else they're dumb. And <laughs> that's, that's not a good way to build relationships with your coworkers. No, not normally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's just this general feeling from various parts of companies where it's like, it's all seen as too abstract and it's all seen as too theoretical and it's all seen as the classic line that wouldn't work here stop talking about it we just need to do some stuff it's like well that's cool and all but again i guess the point of hiring product people is to do product people stuff right so it feels like people should be listened to a little bit but to flip that around then talking about books again if you had to recommend a book about discovery and i'm going to caveat this by saying you can't mention Teresa Torres's book because everyone should already have that. If you had to recommend a second book about discovery to try and get people good at it and try and help people get along and do more of that, like what book would you recommend other than Teresa's? Yeah, I mean, you obviously just hamstrung me because the first thing I was going to say was Teresa Torres's book. Fabulous book, but you can't say it. But if if uh, if that's not the one, the next one that comes to mind for me is Lean UX. Yep. It's a little older, but I think that that's a good book too. Excellent. I'll make sure to uh, link that in so people can go and buy it, make Jeff some money. (laughs) And what's one piece of product science that anyone listening to this should try tomorrow? Like go to work, they've maybe not got all the way up that ladder yet. They can't afford you or they don't, you know, they they can't get hold of you and actually contract you anytime soon. But they want to get started. They want to do something. So what's one experiment they can do to make their product life a little bit better tomorrow? I think the first place to start is trying to add discussion about what you've learned to your team demos. So I call it the built learned planning demo. So instead of a demo where you're just saying, this is what I built, you also say, this is what I learned. And you say, this is what I'm planning to do next. Yeah. And I think just that small change to the process can have a really big ripple effect because you start training everyone around you to care about what you've learned and to care about how it affects yeah. your plans and to start expecting that actually the things you learn are going to change your plans, which like, it sounds so obvious, but it's not. I mean, so many times <laughs> we work in environments where we learn things and then we just put our head down and, and go yeah. forward anyways, because, you know, the boss asked us to. <laughs> so getting, getting that, that exposure for the value of learning is the place to start. Sounds good. And I just had another thought, actually, kind of combining the advice they could follow if they can't get hold of you, but also talking back about books. I mean, is there a Holly Hester Riley book coming up? Oh, well, that's so nice of you to ask. I definitely hope to write one one day, but I haven't started writing anything. (laughs) So we'll see. So we should keep our eyes open and hope for something to come over the horizon. Yeah, exactly. And then maybe that can be the book that people recommend when they're not recommending Teresa Torres' book. Yeah, that's my that's my hope. <laughs> and where can people find you after this if they want to talk about product science or product discovery or just product stuff in general? Well, they can find me at h2rproductscience.com and on Twitter as h2rproductsci, which is uh, just ends with S-C-I because h 2 product science letters? was too long. Yeah, exactly. There you go. I ran out of letters. <laughs> Always a problem. Well, I'll make sure to link that in and hopefully people can come across and find you, connect and start to learn how they might get up the ladder themselves. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously really grateful for you to come on, spend some time and talk a little bit about your ladder and some of the ways that people can make products a little bit better. Obviously, we'll stay in touch. But as for now, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, 
yeah thank you as well it's been a pleasure and i look forward to having you on my podcast so oh, there you go. listeners can look forward to that too as always thanks for listening i hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful if you did again i can only encourage you to pop over to one night in product.com check out some of my other fantastic guests sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure you share it with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again i'll be back soon with another inspiring guest but as for now thanks and good night <laughs>